Please welcome Ellie Nürbig. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. And replacing Alain Badiou doesn't make sense, really. So uh, I won't even be pretending to do anything like he could do uh, here. Um, so I guess the, the aim of my talk is only to suggest a method, some kind of method, some tools for dealing with a particular mode of temporal experience, which, as you already told us, uh, which I like to call floating time. So hopefully I won't be floating too much and take care of this. Um, of, of the clocks. Uh, this temporal mode, um, uh, which, as you will soon realize, um, is of direct relevance for our understanding not only of time or temporal um, issues, but of coexistence and the notion of community as well. Um, <clears throat> this mode, I think the best way to introduce it is really to, to provide a direct example of what I have in mind. Uh, an example that I think is of direct relevance to our understanding of coexistence and community when these terms start themselves to float somehow. So I'll start in medias res, so to speak. Here is a, an excerpt from a broadcast by Al Jazeera. This is an episode, let me first explain a little bit the context. It's an episode from the February 2011 uprising in Egypt. So it's a scene of coexistence, a stage of coexistence, if you like. I'm interested in what's happening there, at this specific location, which is called Tahrir Square. Um, and um, it's, it used to be, and it still is, the epicenter of protest in, in Egypt. And the scene you, you're about to see is historical, and I'd say, in retrospect, uh, prophetic, because it clearly foreshadows what we are witnessing today as I'm speaking on the very same place, at the very same location. So we are, um, it's February 11, 2011, uh, sometime during the evening, in fact, it's really 6 o'clock, um, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak stood down, as you know, and handed over power to the Supreme Council of the Armed Force. And the news of this resignation was, of course, immediately relayed by every news channel around the world, first among which the notorious Al Jazeera, who on that particular night afforded itself um, the narcissistic, the quasi-closed-circuit spectacle of its own breaking the news to the crowd standing on Tahrir Square, um, and almost immediately switching live to cover the reaction of that crowd, a crowd exploding with joy while watching its own image projected on the giant television screen set up in the middle of the square to broadcast the revolution in real time, of course, in defiance of the official state television. See, already the uh, installation is almost a kind of contemporary art video piece in itself. So this is what you saw on Al Jazeera as you were sitting in Paris in your living room. Let me fast forward a little bit. Close up on the crowd, the cheering crowd. So this lasted a while, and then people just walked in the streets and danced and partied and all that. A split screen, always useful. A split screen to document, to register the simultaneous uh, event in different parts of the of the square. And it goes, it goes on like this. Not a very interesting piece of uh, information because you don't really get to see anything with people cheering, basically. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the conjoined power of the close-up, the split screen, the panoramic view, 
and all this nice technology were not enough to capture the real event, the real event that was actually happening at that precise moment in Tahrir Square, which is not so much the resignation of a dictator, nor exactly the expected celebrations and the massive car honking that ensued nationwide, but the fact, the fact that at that very moment, at the very moment the news hit the crowd, several hundreds of protesters, did you notice them, were busy bowing in prayer in a densely packed corner of the square, performing as they were um, uh, what is called the Isha, the regular Isha, the night Muslim prayer. So you, need, you really needed sharp eyes to notice it, but you could definitely see it here at the periphery of the screen, not of the square, of the screen, um, right above the banner bearing the title of uh, the news network and the famous logo. And here is what another witness could record from his particular point of view, situated amongst, or let's say at the threshold of this group in prayer. So this is a raw footage that has been circulating for a while on the internet, on social networks, and I'm indebted, I should say from the outset, to my good friend Doc Zabugnon, who first brought this to my knowledge. You can still find it on YouTube. So here I, I will naturally fast forward a little bit when necessary, because this is a 10 minutes document. So the person is most likely filming with a video device, a mobile device or something of that kind. Here's what you get. So this is a few minutes before the announcement of Mubarak's resignation. Hear the telephone ringing? Telephones all over the place. So it's something like 4 minutes to 6 p.m. local time in Cairo. At 6 p.m., the it was officially announced that the much-hated dictator had stepped down, and of course we're not there yet. And what we witnessed for the three first minutes of this document um, is people praying, you know, and uh, the recording of the ritual formulas is playing, or maybe there's someone singing live, I'm not sure. So let me now get to the moment, the moment we're all expecting, since I broke the news in advance, at 3 minutes 40 something. Well, this is, people are still praying. At 3 minutes 40 something, the news hits the crowd, thanks to Al Jazeera. So there you go. And this is the most interesting part, of course. Because people praying on the square is a very common scene. It's Friday, so even more uh, expected. Thank you. The news of Mubarak's resignation was just announced. And you can already hear the rumor of the crowd building up. Everybody's yelling, shouting, screaming. We just saw that a few minutes ago. But the people, the group that was intensely focused in that activity, doesn't seem to realize. I mean, the group doesn't seem to realize what's going on around them. Of course they know. Of course they know. They are perfectly aware of what's happening. But still, none of them deviates one bit from the ritual. Not even a glance. It's quite impressive, see? this faculty of dissociating oneself from what's happening at the same spot. See? So, there are, it's not very clear from the sound, but you, could, you can imagine how they're, you know, they're massively enveloped by the, cl the clamor of the surrounding crowd, uh, and they're holding their ground ineffective. They pursue the second movement of the ritual prayer to the end, and that lasts for three very long minutes, what must have been the longest minutes in Tahrir Square, uh, Square ever. So I'll, I'll have to fast forward here. Well, this guy is a little bit distracted. I think the, the person who's recording the, the scene just filmed himself, witnessing this amazing scene. They're still praying not paying attention to what's going on. And so after three very long minutes, this is what you get. 
but let me not miss it because it's quite intense. The last 30 seconds of the ritual prayer. Micro doesn't even work anymore. Three minutes delay. Of course, as soon as they're finished with the job, they raise, they shout, they dance, they join in the event. Um, and the rest is expected, I and mean, there's no difference anymore between these people. They're basically sharing the same emotion. But it's been delayed for three long minutes. But I wanted to show you this, and my time is almost up now. So, um, I have not much more to say. Um, no, there would, there would be much more to say about this particular piece, this document, the way it's filmed, the position of the witness, and all that. The way, what I'm interested in is the way it portrays in a very vivid way uh, um, a sense of uh, what you might call a staggering community. Something, a sense of community that at one, once connects and separates the, mul the multitude of uh, groups and individuals that compose the, this motley crowd of protesters sharing in the same celebrations. As far as, as far as time and event are concerned, let me say this uh, first. Um, contrary to what Al Jazeera uh, would have us believe, the news of the event, broadcasted as it was in so-called real time by 24-hour news channels, the, the news um, obviously did not, was not delivered as a simple piece of information that could have landed on the desk or the, the, the screen of, a, of an, an executive. It was not delivered as it may seem on a giant screen in front of, of a unanimous crowd, for that matter. In fact, it was relayed. Uh, it was, in fact, diffracted through the prism of myriads of mobile devices and instant messaging technologies. And uh, as we just saw, uh, the way it has been actually spreading this news through the crowd, um, assumed a strangely atmospheric, diffuse or dispersed quality. That's why I, what the metaphor that comes to mind is that of a cloud surrounding these people in prayer. Um, so the news is kind of percolating through these people. You may say the event builds like a, like a storm, but when the lightning strikes, the lightning breaks and strikes, it is only from a bird eye point of view, from very far away, that it seems to spread like wildfire. It doesn't happen this way for these people. A close up, uh, uh, as we, the kind we've seen, reveals uh, much more complex, much more dilated durations. The event does not quite evaporate, of course, it's massively present, it's massively effective, but it diffuses slowly like a mist, provided we, we know how to record it, register it properly. So other analogies come to mind, liquid analogies, uh, relaying this atmospheric imagination. The news hits the crowd like a wave, you might say. So the phrase goes, like a wave. But owing to the kaleidoscopic uh, process of diffraction I just mentioned, the wave front soon loses its sharp edges. In fact, the wave itself appears to be made of a diversity of subcurrents, countercurrents, turbulences, submerging the crowd at various speeds. So we might remember what Michel Serre uh, at some point explained in his book, The Five Senses, but he also alludes to it in his uh, discussion with Bruno Latour. Um, he says, uh, I quote from The Five Senses, time does not always flow, time percolates, sometimes filtering through and sometimes not. Along the way, end of quote, along the way there are things backing up and creating obstructions. One might uh, imagine, I quote, closures and openings fluctuating and feeding into one another randomly in space, end of quote. Thus time does not follow, uh, th sorry, does not flow in a pure channel, 
says Sir, a perfect corridor with no sidings or bottlenecks. It is not a river, or, if you want to call it that way, it is one that incessantly deviates from its equilibrium. Accordingly, contemporaneity, or simultaneity, if you want, is not of one piece. It comes in the form of small lakes in which creeks keep discharging themselves, delaying the overall flow, and creating, in turn, new bifurcations and new delays. So that's pretty much what this particular scene illustrates in its own way. That it's a, a close-up of a more global process. I'm sure there are other individuals, other groups, that were sort of present there, sharing in, and yet somewhere else. Or uh, some kind of similar split attention. But I have no idea what they could be. I'm sure they were. Um, the impersonation of time as a river, or uh, as an espresso machine, to follow Serre, uh, should not divert us too much, though. I think this is important to, to remember. I mean, what, what I'm concerned here is not the particular empirical models that you could you know, get from science or from perceptive evidence. <laughs> it's the fundamental operations that these models help laying bare. So what is important to me is not so much, to quote from Sale, the turbulent, the chaotic nature that underlies the so-called flow of time, it is, uh, as far as simultaneity is, con is concerned, the fact that the coexistence of events, which are part of the same wave of co-presence, you might say, that this coexistence can be locally disconnected. I mean that the people sharing in that wave can be locally disconnected from each other by virtue of certain mechanism, psychological, emotional, social, whatever, uh, mechanisms of delay or defacing. In brief, I think right, please, I'm, I'm going to uh, take a, another step of abstraction. What is at stake, I think, is the shift from a geometrical or linear notion of time as a series of successive instants or point-like events, or if you like, but it amounts to the same. Time as a stratification of timelines stitched together at particular junctions along the series, the shift from that fairly classic view of time to a topological notion that is more concerned with the intervals or zones of disconnection opened up between two instances of connection. More interested in that than in the mere fact of temporal coincidence, which we tend to associate with the very notion of simultaneity. So this train of ideas, if you accept to follow, them, follow me for a while, this strain of ideas finds an echo um, in one of the most perplexing uh, of the many paradoxes of relativity theory. Namely, what is sometimes referred to as the path dependency of elapsed time. The path dependency of elapsed time. Simply said, the fact that the time it takes for a particular process to unfold locally, that's from place to place, the time it takes really depends on its actual trajectory through space-time. In other words, it depends on its dynamic relation to the rest of the universe. There's no way you can, you can uh, assign a particular time of the process without relating, locally relating the process as it unfolds to the rest of what's happening elsewhere. Paul Langevin, Paul Langevin the French physicist, has popularized this result in the form of a nice parable known as the twin paradox, or the paradox of the twins. You've heard the story of the traveling twin shooting out in the direction of a distant star at a speed close to that of flight, making a U-turn and rushing back home. According to the theory, and I should emphasize the fact that this is not a simple story, it's, a, it's, a, it's an uh, imaginative illustration of an actual result, a very serious result, a very deep result of the theory. According to the theory of relativity, the total elapsed time of the traveler may be, let's say, two years, or less or more, as he gets back home, depending on the way he's been accelerated through space, he will find, on return, that 20 years have elapsed on, on Earth, or 200 years, again, depending on its actual motion. So 20 years, 200 years, whatever, have elapsed on Earth for, for his twin brother, while two years have elapsed for himself. So this is certainly odd and puzzling. And it may be argued that one of the morals of the story, this little tale, is that time is, at root, a dynamical and 
local dimension of concrete processes. It's a local dimension of concrete, that is, particular processes, rather than a universal dimension of becoming in general, as Bergson used to say. Time is not a universal clock, nor a universal dimension of becoming in general, which we could apply to anything indifferently. It is intrinsically tied to what's happening, when it's happening. And this conclusion, of course, I think would not have bothered that song too much, provided that he had grasped what was really going on uh, on that particular point. But this is a, another story. The second remark uh, regarding this, uh, this analogy I'm trying to draw with uh, relativity theory is that it is equally important to observe regarding Langevin's paradox that although the situation of the twins seems to preclude any sense of a global time, there is a very obvious sense, there is a very obvious sense in which the two twins can be said to coexist. And that's what of, what's of interest to me. It's not because you've gotten rid of global time that the notion of coexistence is irrelevant anymore. The time of their separation is, of course, spelled out differently along each track. It's, spelled, it's measured differently by each. But once they're reunited, they participate again in the same time flow. And they can both agree, in retrospect, that while one of them was traveling away, more time was elapsing for the other on Earth. Why? Meanwhile. It still makes sense to talk that way. So there is a discrepancy between the local measured time, or proper times, as physicists put it, but there is a clear sense of their being together in time, somehow. How? How are you together in time without any sense of global time? Um, this notion of um, distended coexistence, if you want, or defaced community, is not so different. That's my contention. It might seem far-fetched, but I'd like to pursue. Uh, this notion of co defaced community is not so different from what was witnessed on Tahrir Square in February 2011. You may say that for a while, the twin Muslim brothers shared the same envelope of coexistence with the rest of the crowd, while flowing along a different temporal course. So around 6 p.m. in Cairo that day, time has been floating for three minutes. Or is it three minutes? But who's going to tell? Who's going to measure that interval? That's a, an issue I leave aside. Um, now I'd, I'd like to come to the more conceptual point. And first, some clarification is in order. What I mean by floating time, is not quite uh, a time out of joint, at, as it has been fashionable to say. I mean, it's a much abused Shakespearean formula, which has become something of a mantra for many delusions. Um, and I think it's well, it's a very it's beautiful, but it's at once too radical and too imprecise for what I have in mind. In fact, floating time is not unhinged. It's not out of joint. It is merely loosened. Loosen, distended. And it still enables time to play the role that is naturally expected from time, as we know it. I mean time, sorry for this gesture, time as opposed to duration, precisely, as opposed to becoming, as opposed to process. I mean the role of a frame, a framing device, allowing for a plurality of local durations to be apprehended together if not coordinated, if not synchronized. I mean, the f basic function of time is that of a great coordinator. And that's what separates it fundamentally from the notion of duration, who take, which takes its root in the local experience of something unfolding from place to place. Th there is an image from Michel Butor, a French writer, which Jean-François Lyotard uses in his book, Discourse Figure, which I believe was his uh, dissertation thesis. It illustrates a central concept in the book, namely that of floating space. So he's dealing with floating space, not floating time, precisely. But it's still, um, I think, illuminating. The concept is uh, not directly suited to my purpose, although it, it involves a temporal aspect. One of the characteristic traits of floating space as defined by Lyotard, is, 
indeed to induce a prolonged oscillation of the gaze between two heterogeneous space, spaces. Sorry. Uh, when Lyotard speaks of spaces in, in that context, it's not limited to visual space, of course. It can include all kinds of surfaces offered to reading or interpretation. And you have an experience of floating space whenever two heterogeneous space, spaces sorry, um, are sort of brought together, telescoped, and offered for a kind of simultaneous reading. Yota grants his demonstration on careful explorations of Cezanne's painting, of Clay's drawing, of the aberrant perspectives named anamorphoses, as well as on the psychoanalytical practice of so-called lateral, diffuse, suspended, or free-floating attention. And we maybe add uh, some interesting thoughts on that. But it is in connection with, with Michel Butor's graphic and literary experiments entitled Illustration that Lyotard suggests the best metaphor for floating space. Space is floating, he writes, I quote, floating like those convoys of logs hauled to the sea on the lakes of Scandinavia. Groups whose length and width are invariable, but that hug the undulations of the water's surface and therefore fluctuate in height or depth. In Michel Butor's work, the elements are, I quote again, fastened together by syntactic ties that prevent them from dispersing and coming apart. The mobility lies in the blanks, which are of unrestricted proportions and in, an, the, and in the unusual use of the different printing types. Just as the water's undulations can be perceived with much greater accuracy thanks, thanks to the distortions they provoke on the surface of the bound set of logs, and bound is italicized, so the linguistic consistency maintained in the text, in Butor's text, allows the reader to feel the undercurrents that sway the unwritten layers upholding the logs of language. The latter operate as amplifiers, and this is what their rigidity is for, serving as eco-chamber for processes such as displacement, substitution, and condensation that otherwise would go unnoticed. We recognize the psychoanalytical vocabulary. So much for Lyotard. So my contention now is that time itself can be submitted to a similar treatment. Instead of being dispensed with altogether, which is what Lyotard at times suggests when he, for example, emphasizes the essentially repressive, I quote, function of the logic of temporal order. So precisely, in order to loosen the grip of temporal order in his repressive function, I suggest we shift the focus from, from the linear unfolding of temporal order the successive series to or toward simultaneity, sim, sorry, simultaneity relations. So we have to, to shift the focus from the linear series to these moments of simultaneity, which are implicit in the very concept of floating space. Of course. So before I go on, I should add that the expression floating time, this I'm really speaking about floating time, this expression does appear as a, uh, and, and quite uh, repeatedly in Deleuze, who borrows it from Boulez. I have to make this clear because the way I'm using floating time is not exactly similar to the use Deleuze makes of it. Uh, I can refer you to the 1978 conference, uh, sorry, lecture at the Institut de Recherche et Coordination Acoustique Musique, otherwise known as IRCAM, and to several passages of Mille Plateaux dealing with what he, Deleuze, and Guattari described as becoming animal. What Deleuze and Boulez and Guattari are interested in is a notion of non-measured, non-pulsated time, which would allow for a plurality of diversely rhythm durations to be nested within a single but polychronic plane of consistency. I quote from Lee Plateau, a floating time against pulse time or tempo. And this is, of course, a totally Bergsonian figure. And as Boulez rightly emphasized, it is already at play in Wagner's music, for example, when speeds of development seem to be utterly freed from the hold of any formal time for any tempo. 
Stretching this idea to its limits, Deleuze and Gattari put forward the notion of floating music, a music at once floating and machinic, characterized merely by speeds and differences in dynamics. So I'm sure our friend Peter would have plenty to say about this. Now the point for Deleuze, at least, who's not a musicologist, nor a musician, the point for Deleuze is to come up with an adequate impersonation of, I quote, the time of the pure event, or the time of becoming, a time which articulates relative speeds and slownesses independently of the chronometric or chronological values that time assumes in the other moves. In other words, what uh, is achieved through this notion of floating music, which is partly fictitious, of course, is the sense of the floating, I quote, the floating non-pulse time proper to aeon. Aeon is a concept taken from the Stoics, uh, which is defined this way, I quote again, the indefinite time of the event, the floating line that knows only speeds and continually divides that which, and continually, continually divides that which transpires into an already there that is at the same time not yet here, a simultaneous too late and too early as something that is both going to happen and has just happened. This is the time of the event. So this non-chronological time which doesn't allow for any chronometric ordering. ordering. Uh, this is what is uh, opposed to chronos, the time of measure that situates, situates things, persons, uh, in a particular timeline and develops a form, of course, and eventually de it determines a subject. For such is... Uh, I think ultimately what Deleuze and Gattari have in mind and are aiming at with this concept of floating time is the disfiguration or the destitution of the subject as a general instance in charge of coordinating the dimensions of experience, starting with the synchronization of a diversity of heterogeneous durations within a unified now. That's what a subject must do, since Kant, at least that has been one of the major task of the transcendental subject is that you unify the, the, the fabric of experience by getting time right. Okay. So in order to get rid of that figure of the subject, you need to get to uh, floating time in the sense I've just said. And of course, drugs could, ha could help you. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not it's something that is explicitly developed in the same passage. <laughs> it's not an aside. Um, so my problem, as you, as you understand, is not exactly that of speed or slowness considered in themselves. And this is probably the reason I'm not much interested in drugs, I guess referring to a brief coffee break exchange we had with Volkang and Luz a few days ago. My problem here has more to do with delay, with this staggering sense of community or of simultaneity than with speed and slowness per se, or for that matter, the overthrowing of the metron, the common measure. This is not really what is at issue when I use the term floating time. In the sense I'm using the expression, floating time is a time that while allowing all kinds of polyrhythmic, polychronic alterations along the axis of longitudes, so to speak, does not, does not entirely relinquish its function of coordination and synchronization along the axis of latitudes. See? This vertical dimension of time which uh, Deleuze and Gattari are not much interested in. This coordinating function is not, of course, uh, 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 is not necessarily, does not necessarily imply a metric determination of coincidence and simultaneity. And that's exactly the issue. But still, it can be framed, it can be um, exposed in a rather precise terms, I think. Uh, in a way that I, I guess would not be of much interest to a physicist, but which definitely is important to us philosophers if we are uh, to get clear uh, concerning these notions of coexistence, community, simultaneity. How much time do, you, do I have? Because I'm not sure when we started exactly. <laughs> Floating times. Fifteen <laughs> more minutes. I don't think so, but I, no, I'll be brief. So what is the problem, exactly? Let me frame the problem. It's, it's, it's not an easy task to uh, offer a proper exposition of the concept of floating time. The only thing I've done so far is kind of differentiate it from other concepts, other uses. Um, and in fact, 
I'm speaking now for, for myself, for a while I've been struggling with an intuition. I don't think I'm, I got to concept yet. And I'm afraid the best I can do tonight is show in which direction one should work in order to obtain an adequate definition. On the other hand, what I can tell you, and what I can be clear about, is the motivations for such uh, an endeavor. In fact, as you all know, simultaneity has been, for the past hundred years or so, a structuring theme of late and even post-modernism. And it's even been, you might say, a rallying cry for many avant-garde uh, in art as well as theory. Some have interpreted this as a rehabilitation of space against the tyranny of time. This tyranny of time that's supposed to be associated with the historicist, evolutionist paradigms, uh, which again supposedly dominating, dominated 19th century thought. Foucault himself indulged in that kind of characterization at the heyday of structuralism. But its principle is as old as the Bergsonian fashion itself. For example, in 1927, Wyndham Lewis, Lewis wrote, uh -huh. this is interesting, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's quite interesting. I have a blank. So I guess this illustrates the syntactic uh, floating logs uh, that Lyota referred to earlier. So I have to make up this quote. Oh, yeah. <laughs> William Lewis said something uh, like, um, uh, we don't need time, we need space. <laughs> 1927. It just disappeared from my screen. It's, uh, it's going to be a problem because I have two other quotes like this, which I... I've, uh, I'm ashamed to say I had to uh, capture from my screen directly and insert as images. That's why they disappear. Okay, this is of course an oversimplification, this notion that now, now we're done with time, we have to, to get interested in space. For the point, my point at least, is precisely to reach a temporal understanding of simultaneity itself, or which amounts to the same, to find spatial similes that will enable enable us to grasp uh, this lateral or vertical dimension of time we naturally associate with the idea of the simultaneous, and more generally with the experience of things happening at once, zugleich, in German. Well, there's a nice nuance to, to make between simultaneität and gleichzeitigkeit, uh, um, uh, but I won't go into the details of this. I mean, Husserl, others have dealt with that. Uh, I'll speak in English. Simultaneity has served many and perhaps too many causes in the 20th century. It has received contrasting interpretations, and I think we should dwell a little bit on this in order to understand the more, the deeper motivations of my, my little concept of floating time. The futurists, of course, witnessing the advent of fast cars, the telephone, wireless communication. The futurists praise speed as well as, I quote from manifesto, the possibility of being in two places at the same time. They hail the ability of cinema, I quote again, to give the intelligence a, prodig a prodigious sense of simultaneity and omnipresence. Some 60 years later, inverting the explosive rhetoric of the futurist manifesto, Virilio, Paul Virilio, laments over the disastrous consequences of time-space compression, the obliteration of genuine presence, affected by new technologies of instant communication, and, I quote, the elimination of delay, the abolition of space achieved by ubiquity, etc. Apollinaire in Zone, Sandra in La Prose du Transsibérien, celebrate simultaneism. In Picasso, in Braque, in Delaunay, the poet Jacques Barzin, it's not the best French poet, but still interesting, wrote uh, nice pages on, on the same ideas. Joyce and Virginia Woolf experimented with the, I quote from Woolf, the quote was already given by Jacques Rancière a few days ago, experimented with a myriad of impressions, the incessant shower of innumerable atoms falling upon the mind from all sides. Implicitly, I think we should hear simultaneously. Stigler, Bernard, taking up a well-known Benjaminian theme, criticizes the generalization of dispersed attention, the dangers of a global synchronization of consciousness, etc. So, you see, simultaneity has been, from the very start, credited with opposite virtues. And it's, it's not just a shift uh, in, in fashion, because today, I, I, I thought it was a bit boring to quote them, you'll find hosts of 
um, uh, enthusiastic uh, proponents of simultaneity. Of course, not everyone is sharing Virilio or Stigler's views on that count. Um, I think the, the ambivalence has always been there from the start. There are those who saw in the simultaneous team a promise of universal communication and communion, in brief, a new holistic form of the community, the one described by Jules Romain, for example, the advocate of unanimism, the author, the author of the wonderful La Vie Simultanée, a, a collection of poems. The theme still resonates with some inflections in contemporary versions of Teilhard de Chardin's noosphere in the realm of digital media and cyber, cyber culture. And um, the idea being that uh, somehow the digital noosphere could enable the media monads, as I think you describe them, um, to short circuit the ponderous chains of causality and uh, get to a sense of simultaneity, which brings with it the emanc emancipatory promise of universal convergence of good wills, the triumph of spirit over matter, if you like. I, I pass. Not everyone sees it that way. And here again, from the very start, some people have emphasized the disjunctive or disruptive side of simultaneity, even among the proponents of simultaneity. There were those who accentuated disjunction rather than this conjunctive um, um, uh, aspect of coexistence or simultaneity. Uh, there were those who accentuated, uh, through various techniques of polyphony or counterpoint, or alternating between voices or narrative threads, this disjunctive side. Owing to this elaborated splicing, splicing techniques inspired by cinema, simultaneity became synonymous with perceptive disorientation, and not necessarily in a bad way. It led to the shattering of experience into disjointed or loosely hanging fragments, and again, this need not be a source of lamentation. In different ways, modernist writers such as Proust, Joyce, and Woolf, again, have seen in this new perplexing situation of the contemporary subject the premises of a world emancipated from the old hierarchies and regimes of identifications of agents and actions. I'm almost quoting from you, Jacques Rancière. Um, for them, simultaneity meant, above all, a disruption of the logic of temporal order. There it is again the temporal configuration, or disposition, which informs every history, every story, and is reflected, of course, in what Virginia Woolf described as the formal railway, the formal railway line of the sentence. It's like the sentence itself, the syntax of our languages, reflected this temporal disposition, which is so fundamental. Now, simultaneity is a, a way to break, uh, to break uh, this... Uh, Mold. Um, and thus, uh, owing to these different techniques, polyphonic, counterpoint, the narrative succession of significant events that traditionally contributed to the unfolding of an, over, an, an overarching plot could be dismantled in favor of moments of epiphany where time seemed almost frozen, suspended, floating. You see that this, this, this disruptive power of dispersed, dispersed sensory micro-events opened up the possibility of reframing the world according to a, democ a democratic sensibility, the democratic plurality of shifting perspectives, rather than some all-encompassing master plan. This particular form of acosmism, contrary of cosmic impulse, this particular variety of acosmism has been an ongoing subject of fascination for philosophers. It heavily resonates, of course, in Deleuze's reading of Proust, the simultaneous affirmation of incompossible views or perspectives offers for the philosopher a model for the kind of plane of consistency without totalization, which he believes is needed in order to achieve a new image of thought. Now, the truth is that the overall meaning of this kind of uh, simultaneous coexistence uh, played out by the polyphonic techniques is more often than not underdetermined and simply undetermined for uh, the very artists, the very writers who use them. 
I think that's an important point to make. If you look, for example, at the 19th section that make up the amazing chapter of Ulysses called Wandering Rocks, which is kind of transverse, a transversal cut of the city of Dublin, the way it manages to capture the simultaneous activity of the city by constantly shifting focus, the contrapuntal composition of the uh, many episodes that make up this uh, simultaneous stage, uh, are at once conjunctive and disjunctive. Uh, repetition itself, as well as the overlapping uh, and the seamless shifts in, per in perspective, suggest the interconnectedness the interconnectedness of things as much as their dispersion. So even when Joyce's prose seems to reach a paroxystic level of dispersion, it manages, it still manages to string things together in run-ons by the mere play of conjunctions, by virtue of which disparate timelines seem to flow, to, to, to penetrate each other and form a thick present, a kind of thick present that is at once expanded and compressed as a result of the conjoined operation of juxtaposition of spatially distant events and uh, the, uh, the proper operation of the interior monologue, which acts as a guiding thread, as a connecting thread all along. So, as you see, uh, the ambivalence runs at every level. There's no way you could determine it by the mere form, uh, aesthetic form offered to judgment, whether, it's, uh, uh, whether it bears, it doesn't bear on its sleeves uh, an ideological interpretation, basically. That's my point. There's an oscillation between seemingly opposite readings of simultaneity, which is in itself instructive, because I think it tells something about the difficulty we encounter in trying to think a plane of experience that is at once densely connected and full of gaps, discontinuities, and intermittents. And the challenge, my challenge, is to integrate, as you may have realized, simultaneity on the one hand and delay on the other hand connection and separation conjunction and disjunction in one single format in order to make sense of the diverging interpretations that keep crossing each other's path uh, for regardless of their ideological orientations the pros and contrasts of simultaneity at least agree on one point the fact that Simultaneity is the overarching theme of the age and the thing to do or the thing to think. Even by you, since he's not here and I'm replacing him, I might as well quote him. Even by you, who once advocated, I quote, the abolition of the category of time. In order to center a political reflection upon the present moment of the decisive act, the act that decides what is rather than what may come, the act that decides what can be, rather than what might be, even Badiou cannot help joining in the simultaneous anthem when he writes in the century, for example, we have entered a period of atemporality and instantaneity. So, um, I should conclude, nevertheless. Um, and I will conclude in two ways. I mean, it's going to be a kind of an expanded conclusion, I'm afraid. Still, I'm reaching the last stage of my talk. These three concepts, which I've kept using, simultaneity, coexistence, community. Um, in order to give some background to the whole project, I think we should remember they're closely related. I mean, before taking on a social or political meaning, they were worked out by the classical metaphysical tradition, and most notably with Wolf, the most famous among Leibniz's followers or disciples, who inscribed simultaneity under the heading of a general question, which he described as nexus rerum, the connection of things. Kant inherited, from, inherited this classification, as is uh, attested by the third analogy of experience, the section of the critique of pure reason devoted to the category of community, the temporal meaning of which is simultaneity, according to Kant a notion which, in turn, underlies the scheme of so-called reciprocal action, interaction, local interaction. So, and this is under the heading, the category of community in, in Kant's critique. Now, you see that the way it's been framed, right, this is about, what, 100 years before the simultaneous uprising that I've been describing, um, simultaneity was already woven 
from a philosophical point of view, in the spatial-temporal fabric of things. Uh, simultaneity, as defined by Kant, is the temporal dimension accounting for the kind of instantaneous action at a distance assumed by Newtonian dynamics. The dynamics of reciprocal action. Things are together, not merely by the fact that they can be juxtaposed in space, that's spatial coexistence, but more profoundly, perhaps, in Kant's view, by the fact that they can hang together in time, that's temporal coexistence. And the model, the model for this for this form of togetherness is provided precisely by the relations of simultaneity, which themselves enable one to think relations of causal connection occurring in local, local interaction or reciprocal action. The resulting view, which is again the classical metaphysical view of the nexus, of the, of the connection of things, is, as you might have expected, a classical one. It is a densely connected plenum where everything can be said without further qualifications to be holding together at every moment of absolute time. So behind the ordinary uses of simultaneity, there is this sense of a common now embracing everything that happens to be there at once, so glad, and this owing to the deep belief in reciprocal instantaneous action at a distance, which is ingrained in the very... Uh, in the, the fundamental concepts of Newtonian dynamics. And I'd say this is clearly the kind of notion we have in mind when we refer today to the notion of simultaneity. Uh, it took us about, what, 300 years to digest Galileo's revolution, the re relativization of space. It is no surprise that it should take us a little more than 100 years to digest Einstein's relativization of time. Uh, what did we learn from Einstein, or rather what did we not quite learn, is that there is no such thing as instantaneous action at a distance. So every speed is finite. You cannot reach the speed of light. Unless you're already there, that means you're a photon. There's no way you can overcome light. There is a, a horizon, a cinematic horizon, to the world at last. And the result, of course, is that the notion of togetherness, the notion of simultaneity, becomes a problem again. So this is where I will not really stop, but introduce my last, you might say, the last uh, piece of evidence for this uh, trial of time that I'm trying to instruct. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another example. I could have started with that one, but it sounded to me a bit uh, bookish. Um, it's taken from Jean-Paul Sartre's Carnet de la Drôle de Guerre, Diaries of a Phony War. And I'm afraid I must quote him in full. Not the full book, but the passage. <laughs> so, I quote from Sartre. So you all know what the phony war is, right? It's this strange period where... Well, how can I describe it? It's a strange period around 3940, last century, when uh, officially the war <coughs> had broken, but uh, people were kind of waiting for actual action, <laughs> right? So um, Jean-Paul Sartre was part of this, so one of the ancients should know what, what, he was, uh, what his mission was exactly. I think it was with, with the telephone brigade or something like that. He was not, he was not holding a rifle, basically. But he was away for a while. And that's his point. Um, he's writing something that, uh, of course, relates to his uh, ongoing epistolar uh, relation with Simone de Beauvoir. Not strictly epistolar, of course, but um, that's, that's his concern here. He sends her letters. I quote, I've already said that war could serve as justification. It lightens. It lightens. Not it lightens. It excuses from being there. Now I see, now I see that death can too. South can be great at times. It's so difficult just to live without being in any way justified. All in all, this paroxysm of passion is quite simply the unveiling, motivated by an external circumstance, of a whole dimension of my universe and my future. And at the same time, the unveiling of the terrible simultaneity the terrible simultaneity, which fortunately remained hidden from us most of the time. 
the I, I repeat, the terrible simultaneity, which fortunately remains hidden from us most of the time. I imagine if one lived that simultaneity here, in its full dimensions, one would spend one's days with a heart that bled like Jesus. If you could live fully here, simultaneity, you would live for the rest of your life, the rest of your days, with a heart bleeding like Jesus. But many things screen it from us. Simultaneity is screened from us. For example, the letters I receive take three days to get here. So I live in suspense between past and future. The events of which I learned took place long ago. And even the short-term plans about which I'm informed have already been realized or failed by the time I learn from them. The letters I receive are straps of present surrounded by future. But it's a past present surrounded by a dead future. I myself, when I write, hesitate between two times. That in which I am, while I pen the line for the recipient, Simon, that in which the recipient will be when he reads my words, or she. It doesn't make the surrounding unreal, merely timeless. As a result, uh, sorry, as a result of which it's blunted and loses its harmfulness. Thanks to which, my present here, my neutral present, can get some of its color back. I can value certain things, my reading, my little morning at the rose, etc. Similarly, the letters I receive no longer appear to me as worrying signs of the existence of other consciousnesses, but instead as a convenient form these consciousnesses have assumed in order to travel to me. When I read the letters, I hold these consciousnesses captive in a circle around me. They cannot escape or go off to reflect other skies and other faces. They're a bit petrified, a bit out of date, floating in time. That's my addition. But if simultaneity is suddenly unveiled, then the letter is a dagger, blow, a dagger blow. In the first place, it reveals events that are irreparable since they are past. Secondly, it allows what is essential to escape the present life of those consciousnesses which have survived their letters, which have escaped from them, and which are pursuing their lives beyond those dead messages like living beings beyond their graves. At that moment, I don't know how to put it, it seems to me that it is I who am outdated, <coughs> important, ineffective. I cannot catch hold of my future from here. It is swallowed up when a state of nervousness Whence, sorry, a state of nervous, nervousness that can take the form of jealousy. So you see the subtext all along. Um, this lengthy quote from Jean-Paul Sartre is interesting on several grounds, and I'd like to conclude by simply underlining a few points. Like a splintering wedge, the dagger blow, the dagger blow quality attributed to the lived experience of simultaneity, or should I say the, the feeling of simultaneity, this dagger blow cuts into the comfortable, blunted, suspended present. This present that is sort of floating timelessly between past and future. The blow reveals, unveils, says Sarge, the unbearable fact that somewhere out there, out of my reach, people are living their lives, simply living their lives. Regardless of what they're actually doing, the mere fact that they're living their lives is of course something that kills you. Things are going on as I'm writing, talking, acting. Things that I cannot act upon, that I cannot act upon now. Things which I know are for me already irreparable, says Sartre, because there's no way I can interact with them in real time to change their course at this precise moment. I have to wait. Connections take time, as information must travel along a continuous route in accordance with the principle of locality. Do not miss any step, any mediation. But the time of our waiting is dead time, while remote, consciousness, remote consciousnesses, in plural, go on living their life, their life of their own, like zombies rising up from their graves. This kind of spectral phenomenology, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, proposed by Sartre, this uh, spectral phenomenology of epistolary time, must of course be contrasted with other passages in the same diaries where Sartre seems to associate simultaneity with the invigorating experience of camaraderie in the spirit of Jules Romain's unanimism. There's a strange contrast here. The chief lesson, in my view, is the following. At the heart of the experience of simultaneity 
beneath the iridescent surface of the perceived now that seems to stretch across the whole of nature, there is a blind spot, there is a void. This void, in normal times, is filled with the overwhelming, the, the overwhelming presence of the perceived environment, the immediate environment. The wartime constraints, the unusual delays in the exchange of information, act as an optical instrument enabling the painful realization that the void is there and has in fact been there all along, expressing the limited scope of our perception of things, of our sphere of action. Thus, the experience of my extended presence paradoxically becomes one of ineffectiveness within a temporality <coughs> that should be mine, but which somehow escapes me. It is, at the very least, an experience of separation and disconnection within simultaneity. Sartre's description of the lived experience of simultaneity, this splintered, defaced time of togetherness, reveals an active negativity at play at the heart of co-presence. Looming behind the trivial definition of simultaneity, the fact for several objects to be given together for consciousness, behind this uh, phenomenological trivia, there is a sealed, insulated niche of presence of which I'm expelled. That's the point. A presence out there of which I'm expelled. And I believe that in a very different context, Whitehead's, Alfred North Whitehead's, characterization of the contemporaneity of events in terms of mutual causal independence or separation manages to capture a very similar intuition concerning the hollow, the hollow or insubstantial nature of the extended now. The reason why this hollowness generally goes unnoticed is that our primary access to the now is the vivid experience of lived duration which underlies the feeling of nature as co-present to the perceptions. Um, one may follow up this train of information provided by the surrounding environment, this continuous flow of sensory input, uh, causally, abiding by the laws of action by contact. One would then realize how separate he or she is from that perceived environment, how ineffective its grasp is on the overall present. But this is uh, normally what we do not do. We do not uh, raise to the level of conceived or, as White had put it, propositional simultaneity, and we stick to the phenomenological, comfortable niche that we build for ourselves, fantasizing on global connection and interconnectedness. This is a sorry, a very sorry situation. Um, um, maybe I will stop here because uh, I pretty much, pretty much have said uh, the essential of uh, what I had to say. I thank you very much for your patience.